Can a machine be cool and effective, yet simple and cheap? It's not an idle question, especially when it comes to fighter jets. The short answer is yes, it can. Hello Aviator, Sky here, and today we'll be meeting an aircraft that has won the hearts of the military and their wallets. Introducing the Northrop F-5. The 1950s were a period of changing generations of fighter jets, and this change revealed a clear trend. Aircraft were becoming more powerful, heavier and more complex. While this was exciting, upgrading fleets became a challenge, new toys were becoming too expensive. This, as we know, is a constant problem. While major powers with substantial military budgets sought ways to save money, many other countries couldn't afford even that, settling for aircraft that were both conceptually and physically outdated. The aircraft manufacturer Northup saw a solution to this problem. Unlike most of its peers who sought to make their aircraft as powerful as possible, Northup wanted to create something light, simple and inexpensive, a low-budget option that many could afford, especially since not everyone needs a heavy superfighter. At first, there were problems with the engines, but having found the best option, the engineers turned their attention to the aircraft. The evolution of the project, named the N-156, was accompanied by numerous redrawings, depending on the designer's ideas and the wishes of potential customers, that were also constantly changing. First the Europeans, then the US Navy, but neither were interested. The Air Force seemed to be the primary customer, but they didn't understand the point of this little sparrow. What good were cheap aircraft if they would all be wiped out in an aerial war with the Soviet Union? Nevertheless, it was the Air Force that found a job for the Sparrow, albeit not the one originally planned. They needed to replace the aging Lockheed T-33 trainers with something new, supersonic, lightweight and affordable. Northup seized the opportunity, offering the N-156T, a two-seat jet trainer. Considering that all competitors were building overly complex and expensive aircraft, it was the obvious solution. Thus, in 1959, the YT-38 took to the skies, performing admirably. Surprisingly, it encountered no problems during testing, something quite unusual for the 1950s. At the time, crashing a couple of prototypes was considered a given. The T-38 Talon entered service in 1961 and, as we know today, has certainly earned its place in the aviation world. But Northup continued to push the combat versions, as the problem of aging fleets and, consequently, the weakness of many US allies persisted. Interest in the T-38 allowed it to be expanded to cover the entire platform. The N-156 was successfully included in the Mutual Defense Assistance Act, which effectively subsidized the purchase of American equipment. The prototype N-156F fighter took off in 1959 and immediately proved its reliability. The aircraft broke the sound barrier on its very first flight, something not typically accomplished. Thus, the F-5 fighter was born. Well, it's time to see what it was all about. And here, the aircraft's simplicity became a serious challenge, as it needed to deliver adequate performance while also taking into account its limitations. Let's start with the most important thing, the fiery heart. The irony of the passion for fearsome fighters was the similar passion for large, powerful engines, and no one really made small versions. They had to look for them in unusual places. At the time, the US Air Force was testing a very unusual device, the ADM-20 Quail, formerly a cruise missile, but in reality a sort of drone a decoy designed to imitate a B-52, to confuse enemy air defenses in combat. Northup's interest in this missile was quite specific. Its engine was the tiny General Electric J-85, the very same compact and lightweight version that eventually powered their aircraft. A pair of them were installed on the fighter. The engines are miniature and very light, only about 300 kilograms each compared to their larger siblings, which were much bigger and weighed on average a ton and a half. This miniaturization of course came at a price. The engine produced 1.2 tons force dry and 1.74 tons force with afterburner. The engineers had to work hard to ensure that this childish thrust was sufficient for the aircraft. First and foremost, they seriously worked on the airframe. 
In their quest for aerodynamic efficiency, Northup employed cutting-edge solutions, sleek contours, neat shapes, and the area rule that gave the aircraft a narrow waist, making it very graceful compared to most of its, let's be honest, rather stiff peers. The fuselage is narrow and elongated, with a pair of side intakes. Low wing with small leading edge extensions, large slats, a pair of flaps and ailerons. The tail features a pair of all moving stabilizers and a hefty fin. The tricycle landing gear features single wheeled legs and low pressure mnemonics for operation on unpaved runways. It's funny, the F-5 was the first American jet fighter designed specifically for such conditions, others were far more demanding. All this beauty is 14.35 meters long, with a wingspan of 7.7 .7 meters and a height of 4 meters, a little sparrow. And a light sparrow too, empty weight is 3.6 tons, with a maximum takeoff weight of about 9 tons. For context, the F-4 Phantom II weighed 3 times as much. All these solutions, even with weak engines, gave the aircraft decent flight performance. Cruising speed is 480 knots, maximum almost 808 knots. Service ceiling is approximately 50,000 feet. Range varies depending on the mission, from 370 to 430 miles with full combat load, to around 1400 miles on a ferry flight with dropped fuel tanks. The cockpit and instrumentation were well designed, but very basic, especially in the early versions. To the point that the weapon control system felt like a demo version with an optical sight, and there was no radar at all. On the one hand, this significantly reduced the aircraft's cost, on the other, it was basically impossible to use any sophisticated armament. Only simple weapons remained, such as AIM 9 Sidewinder air to air missiles, AGM 12 Bullpup air to ground missiles, unguided rockets and bombs, and of course, the 20mm M39 cannon two cannons at once. The ordnance load could reach 2.8 tons across seven hardpoints, including the wingtips. And of course, the engineers paid special attention to simplifying maintenance. A quarter of the plane's surfaces was covered in hatches and removable panels, and to replace the engines, you could simply remove the tail section, do everything and put it back like a construction set. Flight testing, which began in 1959, was successful, but no customers came. Foreign customers expected American aircraft to be purchased first, you know, by Americans. But the US Air Force, as I've already mentioned, didn't want this little sparrow in its fleet, which almost halted the entire acceptance process. It wasn't until 1962 that the Kennedy administration put pressure on the Air Force, which eventually placed initial orders for several variants. Given that the aircraft was ready, deliveries began almost immediately. Thus, after years of agonizing debate, the Northrop F-5A Freedom Fighter was officially born. And things took off. Initially, the aircraft was supplied in small batches to the country's own military, primarily for training instructors, who would then train foreign operators. Foreigners quickly arrived. Interestingly, the first was Norway. A wealthy country, but reluctant to spend too much on fighter jets. South Korea, Greece and Iran followed, while license production was established in Canada and Spain. The export potential was beginning to show. Naturally, since it was the 1960s, it was obvious where the freedom fighters would be deployed first – Vietnam. Combat testing was dubbed Skoshi Tiger. Little Tiger in Japanese, and they didn't delay, the aircraft were sent into combat immediately upon arriving in Vietnam. And they worked quite efficiently there, completing around 3000 sorties in just a few months with minimal losses. The aircraft was maneuverable and very small, making it simply difficult to hit. Moreover, it was reliable and incredibly easy to maintain, ensuring excellent combat readiness. But it also had its drawbacks – short range, modest load, poor equipment, and it was hardly a fighter, so it served primarily as an attack and reconnaissance aircraft. The military were afraid to use it against the MiGs, entrusting that job to more savage guys. Therefore, the US Air Force was still skeptical, but the South Vietnamese Air Force, having received a sizable batch, clearly took a liking to it. Combat experience served as excellent publicity for the F-5 further boosting its demand. While it wasn't exactly a superfighter, it was a solid value for its money. 
Of course, the F5 service didn't end in Vietnam. Given its widespread export, it found itself involved in many of its new owners' conflicts, primarily in the Middle East and Africa. The experience of its use in Vietnam became a serious source of reflection for Northup. On the one hand, the aircraft performed well, but on the other, there was clearly room for improvement. This was especially true for its fighter capabilities, which needed to be enhanced at least to counter its conceptually close Soviet adversary, the MiG-21. Thus, the F-5A-21 project was initiated, officially designated F-5E. The name also changed. The original Freedom Fighter didn't catch on with the military, and after the Skoshi Tiger program in Vietnam, the F-5A was simply called Tiger. The F-5E, as its successor, was named Tiger II. The aircraft was equipped with more powerful J-58 engines, larger air intakes and leading-edge extensions. It became slightly larger and heavier, with its maximum takeoff weight increasing to 11.2 tons. Consequently, its speed, weapons load and range also increased. The ideology of avionics simplicity was also toned down. The aircraft received a new weapons control system, finally incorporating the Emerson Electric AN-APQ-153 radar. About time, it was the 1970s, a fighter without a radar was just unseemly. This significantly diversified the weapons range. Over time, the AGM-65 Maverick and AIM-120 MRAM were added. In this updated form in 1973, the F-5E replaced the F-5A. A year later, the two-seat F-5F appeared, replacing the older two-seat F-5B. And then the RF-5E Tiger I reconnaissance aircraft appeared. The Tiger II became even more popular, deliveries were brisk, and production licenses were acquired by Switzerland, South Korea and Taiwan. And of course, they also saw active combat. The largest clashes were probably in the 1980s during the Iran-Iraq war, and the Iranians were very fond of them. Thanks to its simplicity, they were able to continue technical support after the imposition of US sanctions and eventually even established their own small-scale production. The F-5E also had a curious experience in the USSR. After the Vietnam War ended, some of the F-5s remaining there began flying under red flags, and a couple of them were sent to the Soviet Union to learn about their colleagues' achievements, so to speak. They were thoroughly studied, including in training battles against the MiG-21 and MiG-23, and Soviet pilots really liked the plane. It was comfortable, maneuverable, and revealed a ton of surprises in aerial combat. At high speeds and in long-range combat, it was an easy target, but at low speeds in close combat, it became a real problem. The funny thing is, at this time, the Americans were also encountering similar surprises, which I'll discuss a bit later. And of course, having collected this data, the devious Soviets created their own fighter jet, the MiG-28, which by the way fought the F-14. Yes, they even made a movie about it. Meanwhile, the F-5's legacy was pushing forward into a new, fourth-generation fighter. Back in the 1960s, while developing the Freedom Fighter, Northup had looked a little further, towards a larger and more powerful machine. And when the Pentagon initiated a program to create a fourth-generation lightweight fighter, they unveiled their project, dubbed the YF-17 Cobra. Looks familiar, right? In the mid-1970s, the YF-17 competed with the YF-16 and lost when the F-16 was born. But later, it caught attention of sailors and became the Navy's primary carrier aircraft. The YF-17 evolved into the F-A-18 Hornet. Also, the F-5's relatives include the exotic Grumman X-29 Flying Lab with a forward-swept wing as well as the flying lab used by NASA as part of the shaped Sonic Boom program, the forerunner of the current X-59 Quest or Quiet Supersonic Technology program. The fully-fledged next-generation F-5 in the 1980s was bogged down by political gains. At the time, the lightweight F-16 was already flying, but Washington restricted its exports, fearing technology leakage. As an alternative, it was decided to develop a fourth-generation fighter, albeit a slightly simplified one. Thus, the F-20 Tiger Shark project was launched. 
Essentially, the Tiger Shark is a direct descendant of the Tiger II, with design and systems improvements. The main difference is the replacement of two small J85 with a single large F404, which was already installed on the FA18, resulting in a higher thrust to weight ratio. All onboard equipment was new, the armament range was also expanded, and the aircraft could now use AIM-7 Sparrow missiles. The first prototype flew in 1982 and performed quite well. But no matter how much the F-5 was modernized, it was still limited and inferior to the F-16, and its price tag was no longer so strikingly modest. When the Ronald Reagan administration authorized widespread export of the F-16, the F-20 couldn't compete. After several years of political battles, the project was cancelled. Politics created the F-20 and it also killed it. By the time the F-5E appeared, skepticism from the US military had significantly diminished. Yes, the aircraft didn't serve in large numbers in the US, but over time they found their way into the Air Force, Navy and Marine Corps fleets. This doesn't include the T-38 Talon trainer, there were plenty of those. According to various estimates, around 50,000 pilots have passed through their training cockpits. Among them, the Air Force Thunderbirds aerobatic team transitioned from Phantoms to Talons. And again, maintenance was a bonus. It turned out that the T-38 was four times cheaper to maintain than the F-4. Later, their colleagues, the Swiss Patrouille Suisse, the Turkish Stars and the Singapore Black Knights also adopted the F-5. The F-5s also found plenty of other work. They fly in NASA's fleet and participate in numerous research programs. Their training missions also extended to the Aggressor Squadron and the Top Gun Flight School, where they performed the role of enemy aircraft. And here the F-5 began to surprise the Americans no less than their Soviet counterparts. Tigers were once again easy targets in high-speed combat, but in dogfights they could outshine not only their peers like the Phantoms, but also such beasts as the F-14 and F-15. Nowadays, of course, they have been almost completely retired from the US military and replaced by newer aircraft. Simulating a MiG-21 is one thing, but simulating a MiG-29 or Su-27 is quite another, not to mention the fifth generation. The F-5 production ended in 1987, after 28 years on the assembly line. During this time, more than 2,600 combat aircraft were built plus 1,189 Talon trainers. Meanwhile, the F-5s are still in service in 16 countries, and despite their age, I think they'll be flying for a while. Well, that concludes the story of the Little Tiger. Comment what you think about lightness and simplicity in fighter aircraft, and don't forget to subscribe to the channel. Fast flights and soft landings to you.